We're going to be going over Luke chapter 8 today. That is Luke chapter 8. There's a lot to cover. Um, so let's go ahead and get this started. We're going to start with the music by Vesparum.
Good morning. Good morning. As always, thank you, Vesparum, for allowing us to use that, that music. Um, <clears throat> again, we're going to be in Luke chapter 8. We're going to break down Luke chapter 8 section by section. There's a lot of different things going on here in Luke chapter 8. So let's go ahead and open with a prayer, and then we'll get started. If you'll bow your heads with me here. Dear Lord, we just come to you right now and we ask, we ask that it is your words and your message that comes across today. Lord, we ask that we are able to understand your word and that we're able to convey your meaning properly. Lord, we ask that if there's anyone out there that is hurting, anyone out there that is in need of prayer, Lord, we ask that they reach out and, and seek the help that they need. And Lord, we just we thank you for everything that you've blessed us with today. And we ask that you continue to bless us throughout the rest of this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Alright, so Luke chapter 8. Uh, <clears throat> starts out and it says, Soon afterwards he was traveling from one town and village to another, preaching and telling the good news of the kingdom of God. So he's traveling around. It says the twelve were with him. And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits, its evil spirits and sicknesses. And it lists them. Mary called Magdalene, so Mary Magdalene. Seven demons had come out of her. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward. Susanna and many others who were supporting them from their possessions. So you got three listed women, there were many others, that were helping support them and traveling with them and supporting them, giving them the, the money and food and, and helping support them from their possessions. And one of those is Mary Magdalene. We know a bit about her. Another one that's named is Joanna, the wife of Chusa, which was one of Herod, one of Herod's stewards. We know that Herod had nothing but disdain for, for Jesus and John the Baptist, and Herod wasn't a, a, a great person. And you've got the wife of one of his stewards that is going and following Jesus and supporting him with her possessions. And it's really interesting how you've got Herod and Herod's steward, and then the wife of that steward is actually following Jesus. There had to have been some conflict there. So, it's also interesting that you've got the twelve, there, Jesus and the twelve, and they're traveling from town to town, and it's a group of women that are helping support them. It's really interesting how that is going, and how that's going on, it's a group of women that are actually helping support Jesus and the Twelve as they're traveling. So, moving on, verse 4, we've got the parable of the sower. This is where he starts the parable of the sower, and from this point forward, he really uses parables as teaching a lot more often. He really starts going into teaching in parables. And he actually will explain why in a minute. So it says, as a large crowd was gathering, so you got a bunch of people coming and they're flocking up to him from, from different towns and they, they hear his teaching and he's been traveling, they've heard of him, they want to see him, so they start crowding in. And he looks at them and he gives them this parable. He says, verse 5, A sower went out to sow his seed. As he was sowing, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds of the sky ate it up. Other seed fell on the rock. When it sprang up, it withered since it lacked uh, moisture. Other seed fell among thorns. The thorns sprang up with it and choked it. Still other seed fell on good ground. When it sprang up, it produced crop. A hundred times what was sown. As he said this, he called out, anyone who has ears should listen. So what is he getting at in here? Well, he'll explain in a minute what the meaning is. 
But why would he use a parable about sowing seeds to the crowds? Because it's something that they would understand. It's something, it's a metaphor that they would understand. They could, they all knew about throwing seed out. They all knew about planting crop. They all knew about how as you're going along sowing seed and you're throwing the seed out, sometimes some of it falls on good soil, sometimes it falls on the rock, and that one's not going to pop up. Sometimes there's, there's weeds and thorns that pop up and it's going to choke those out. They understand this metaphor. They're going to be able to relate. See, and that's something that we have to look at ourselves. Each one of us has a different testimony. Each one of us has different ways that we can relate to different people. And that's part of how and why there are so many different styles of preaching because it's going to relate to different people in a different way because our story and our testimony may be similar. Nobody's testimony is going to be the same, but you might find somebody that's got a similar testimony, somebody that's got similar interests, somebody that's into different things that you're into, and you're going to be able to relate to them, God's Word, in a different way. So, verse 9, Then his disciples asked him, What does this parable mean? So he said, the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given for you to know, but the rest is in parables, so that looking they may not see and hearing they may not understand. He's actually quoting Isaiah 6, 9, whenever he says that. And he's saying that he, people that aren't into the word of God, people that don't have the Holy Spirit, are not going to be able to understand how all this relates into everyday life. How the Word of God permeates everything in existence, everything that you do, everything that you touch, everything that you see, it, 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 it permeates the existence of God. They're not going to be able to understand it, but you will. So then he goes on and he explains... So there he explained why he uses parables. Now he's going to explain the actual parable of the sower. And he says in verse 11, <coughs> excuse me, he says, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. So that seed that you're going and planting, that's the word of God. You're planting these seeds. That's the word of God planting and producing or not producing. He says, the seed on the path, so remember, on the path, the seed on the path are those who have heard, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. So the one that's on the path that the, the crows come and the, the birds come and they eat that seed, those are like those that have heard the word, so the seed hit the path, and then the devil comes and snatches it up so that they may not believe and be saved. Then you got the seed on the rock, and he says, And the seed on the rock are those who, when they hear, welcome the word with joy, but having no root, these believe, these believe for a while and depart in a time of testing. Their roots can't get into the soil. They have no root. So while it all sounds good and great, and, and, and oh my gosh, this is so great, whenever hard times come, they have no root for their foundation, and they get washed away. Whenever the wind blows, they get uprooted. Whenever the flood comes, they're floating down the river. Because they have no root. So, then we go to Verse 14, As for the seed that fell among thorns, these are the ones who, when they have heard, go on their way and are choked out with worries, riches, and pleasures of life, and produce no mature fruit. So these are the ones that when you plant that seed and, it, and you got all these weeds and thorns and all this other stuff that comes growing up around it and chokes out whatever seed that you're trying to to plant there, you're planting wheat, that wheat plant's not going to be able to thrive, it's not going to produce any, any fruit, it's going to get choked out because of all the other issues in this life. They're not, they're not fully 
able to choke out, or they're not able to push away the thorns and, and thrive because the thorns are too much. There's too much other, other temptations. There's too much other worry. There's too much other earthly life and not enough spiritual life. So, verse 15, But the seed in the good ground, these are the ones who, having heard the word with an honest and good heart, hold on to it, and by enduring, bear fruit. By enduring. It doesn't mean that that, that it just has everything done for them. It doesn't mean that everything's good. It doesn't mean that the wind's still not going to blow against them. It doesn't mean that there's still not going to be floodwaters that come rushing through. But they've got good root. They were able to get into good ground. They were able to put their roots down and hold on during those hard times. So we have to look at where our roots are, how we're going to accept that seed into ourselves, into our heart. How we're going to accept the Word of God, that seed into our heart. Is it just going to be on a, on a solid, huh, rocky heart? Or is it going to be on a fleshly heart that, that, that's free of all the other worries and temptations of the world? Is it going to fall on, on, on the path and not even get to our heart and be taken away by the devil and the, and the birds and the crows? How is the Word of God going to sit on your heart? Is it going to take root? So then we get into the light. Using your light. Verse 16. No one, after lighting a lamp, covers it with a basket, and puts it under a bed, but puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see its light, for nothing is concealed that won't be revealed, and nothing hidden that won't be made known and come to light. Therefore, take care how you listen. For whoever has, more will be given to him, and whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, will be taken away from him. So, when you get this light, when you get this that, that seed, you've got a good, you got fruit producing, you're producing good fruit. Don't hide it. Go and share that fruit. Share the light. The light has come in you. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. When Jesus comes in you, you have a light. Don't hide it. Allow, allow it to permeate through everything. Allow other people, when they come in, they know that you have this light in you. Don't hide it. And when you have it, more will be given to you. When you have it and you sh sh shed out that light, when you let that light out, more light will be given to you to let more out. But if you don't have the light, you think you do, but you ain't got the light, what you think you have, you're going to get even less. It's going to be taken away. Use the light to shine on darkness. It doesn't say fight darkness with darkness. It says use the light on darkness because darkness flees from light. So, verse 19. Then his mother and brothers came to him, but they could not meet with him because of the crowd. So there's so many people there that his mother and brothers can't get to him. And he was told, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. So, Mary and James, they're, they're out there, and the other brothers, they're waiting. They're trying to get to see Jesus. They can't get to him. And Jesus is told, they're trying to get to you, and they can't. You know, do you want to, like, you know, tell the crowd to, 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 to separate so your mom and brothers can get to you? And he says, and this is important, he says, my mother and brothers are those who hear and do the word of God. Is he putting Mary and James and his other brothers, is he putting them down? No. He is not being disrespectful. At all. What he's saying is, my mother and brothers and sisters are those who hear the word of God and, and, and do the word of God. So, I have to put God above my own earthly family. I have to put God first. And those who are putting God first are also my family. 
not taking anything away from Mary or his brothers. He's saying that everyone who does the will of God is also his mother, his brother, his sister, his father. Everyone who hears the word of God and does the word of God is his family. So, <clears throat> verse 22. One day he and his disciples got into a boat and he told them, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. So they set out and as they were sailing, Jesus fell asleep. Then a fierce windstorm came on the lake, and they were being swamped and were in danger. They came and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we're going to die. Then he got up, rebuked the wind and the raging waves, so they ceased, and there was calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? Or in other translations, I really like how it says, O ye of little faith. They were fearful and amazed, asking one another, Who can this be? He commands even the winds and waves, and they obey him. So, let's break this little section down. I just read it. Let's break this down. They're on a boat. They're going across the Sea of Galilee. They're going from one side of this big lake to the other. And you've got four fishermen that have made their living fishing on this lake. They knew this lake. Their life was spent on the water in this particular lake. There's four of them. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Four of them. Fishermen on that lake. Wind picks up and it must have been something bad. Because like I said, you got four fishermen that, yeah, I'm sure they had been in windstorms on that lake before. They had spent their life fishing on it. They come running down, and Jesus is down on that boat, and he is asleep. He ain't worried about it. He's asleep. Uh, okay. He's asleep. He don't care. He's not worried. And they come running down, and these... Among the twelve are four fishermen saying, Master, we're going to die. They're flipping out. We're going to die and you're asleep? So he gets up, rebukes the wind. Again, there's that word rebuke to that, say, a strong word of telling something to stop or, or, or correcting something sternly. He tells the wind, you stop it. And looks at him and says, where is your faith? Now, in right or wrong or indifferent, I have the, the image of them coming down. Jesus is asleep. Them coming down. Master, we're going to die. He gets up. Huh? Oh. Yeah, wind, knock it off. Where is your faith? I'm going back to bed. That's the image that I get is him telling the wind to stop and just kind of with that sleepy-eyed, where's my cup of coffee look on his face, going, y'all woke me up for this? Really? Where's your face? You might have got some more Folgers. He's not worried about it. He's not worried about it at all. He tells the wind to stop, and the wind stops. It stops. And they look at him, and you've got to keep in mind that they had seen him do all these different miracles. You even had already at this point had the centurion who knew that Jesus could command with a word and it would be done. With a word, he commands the wind, and the wind stops. And, how you doing, Ace? And it's one of those, with the word, he commands the wind to stop, and it stops. And they're looking at him, and they're like, who is this that can command even the wind? Yeah. We know that they couldn't fully understand. We know that they weren't fully able to understand at this point, but it's just one of those where you're, you've seen him do all of this. Even the centurion 
pretty well got it that if Jesus said the word, he could command the sickness from way away. Even with just a word, he could command that sickness to leave. And you're over here wondering how he just commanded the wind to stop. He's commanded demons He's com to come out of people. He's commanded sicknesses to leave people. He's commanded all these other things, and you're not able to understand how he just told the wind to stop. Okay. Like I said, we know that they weren't fully able to understand exactly who he was at that particular point, but it's still one of those there had to have been something blocking them from seeing everything because it's... So then we get to verse 26. And it says, Then they sailed to the region of Garcinius, which is opposite of Galilee. So they go all the way across from Galilee, all the way across opposite. When they got on land, a demon-possessed man from the town met him, Jesus, for a long time. So not just a day or two, for a long time. He had worn no clothes and did not stay in a house, but in the tombs. This dude didn't wear clothes and he lived in the tombs. He lived in the catacombs, in the tombs. And he's been this way for a long time. And he saw Jesus and he cried out and fell down before him and said in a loud voice, what do you have to do with me, Jesus, you son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torment me. This demon knew Jesus, begged Jesus, fell down. The demon falls down before Jesus and begs him not to torment him. Now, what does that mean, Jesus tormenting? Well... This demon knows that in the end, Jesus is going to cast all of them into the lake of fire. So he already knows this. And he's begging Jesus not to do it yet. It says, for, for he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him. And though he was guarded... Bound by chains and shackles, he would snap the restraints and be driven by the demon into deserted places. So this dude had been tied up with chains and shackles many times. And he, through the demonic power that was in him, was able to snap those chains and be driven into the wilderness by these demonic powers. These people didn't know what to do with him. They had shackled him up. Put chains on him. And he was snapping them. And this has been going on for a long time. These people, I'm sure, had tried everything that they could think of. And they couldn't control this guy. He's not wearing clothes, so he's probably running around naked. Says he wasn't wearing any clothes, so he's running around naked, living in the tombs, snapping, snapping chains, being driven out to the wilderness by demons. He's got demons... Coming out of everywhere. And he's down on his knees begging Jesus not to torment him. So Jesus says, what is your name? And he's not talking to the man. He's talking to the demon at this point. What is your name? And the answer he gets back is, Legion, he said, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him, Jesus, not to banish them into the abyss. Again, we've got that begging, don't send us into the abyss. Don't send us into the lake of fire yet. We know you're going to eventually. Don't send us there yet. And by the way, this legion, <laughs> this legion would be a Roman unit of measurement. Roman soldiers, a force of 6,000 was a legion. A legion, excuse me. <clears throat> 6,000, it makes up a Roman legion. Was there 6,000 demons in this particular dude? I don't know. But there was so many that the guy, they didn't even want to count. 
he used a large number. So, this is where it gets a little interesting here. It says in verse 32, A large herd of pigs were there, feeding on the hillside. The demons begged him to permit them to enter the pigs. And he gave them permission. He says, okay, you can go into those pigs, but you're going to get out of that guy. Now, why would he allow the demons to go into the pigs rather than casting them into the abyss? Because it wasn't time yet for all of that to take place. And he knows that if he sends them into the pigs, they're going to not be in this guy because this guy now has Jesus in his heart, so they're not going to be able to come back into a, a nice, clean home as it talks about in another place, the, the, the demons coming back to a clean home. He knows that this guy, is once the demons leave, he is going to have Jesus in his heart, and he's, the demons are not going to be allowed to come back. And we'll see another thing in just a second. It says, The demons came out of the man and into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. So Jesus sends the demons out of the man. They go into the pigs. And the first thing that these demons do, the very first thing that they do, is destroy them. That is all that they are after, is to seek and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. They send the pigs, the demons take over the pigs, and the entire herd of pigs run down the hill and die. So these demons would have most likely went back to hell at that point. So Jesus took care of it without having to do much. <laughs> he gave them permission to destroy themselves. Verse 34, When the man who tended, tended them saw what happened, they ran off and reported it to, in the town to the country, and to the countryside. Then the people went to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and found the man found the man the demons had departed from sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. So this guy, like I said, is now sitting in front of Jesus, listening as Jesus is instructing him, is teaching him, is guiding him. This man has now taken Jesus and Jesus is teaching him into his heart. So they see this. And they're afraid because they don't know. They don't know what exactly just happened. And to them, it may look like this guy that had demons is now learning more from a ruler of demons or something like that. That he, he Jesus had that accusation thrust upon him several times, and these people did not fully understand what was going on. They, they don't understand it, so it's it's not going to, it's not going to make sense. It's gonna it's gonna cause fear. <clears throat> By the way, fear a lot of times is an irrational response to something that you don't understand. Irrational response to something you don't understand. <clears throat> Meanwhile. The eyewitnesses reported to them how the demon-possessed man was delivered. So now they're getting, getting more of the story. Then all of the people of the Gersene region asked him to leave them because they were gripped by great fear. So even after they're being, having this explained to them what happened, they're still gripped by this fear because they still don't quite get it. They still don't quite understand how Jesus just did what he did. So, getting into the boat, he returned. The man from whom the demons had departed kept begging him to be with him. But he sent him away and said, Go back to your home and tell all, tell all that God has done for you. And he went off, proclaiming throughout the town that Jesus, all that Jesus had done for him. So, is this a story of Jesus telling him, No, you can't come with me because you had demons? No. It's a story of you have to go and proclaim this to the rest of these people. They're not listening to me. They're not listening to me, okay? You're the one that this happened to, and it, you 
have to go and you have to go proclaim all of these things. You're the one that has it's your responsibility. You have a great responsibility now to go and spread this word. They're not listening to me. Maybe they'll listen to you. When you go and you show them the change that has just happened to you, going from a naked, demon-possessed man snapping, sh snapping shackles and, and, and driving out into the wilderness and living in the tombs, when you go and you show them how you have changed and how God has changed you and give them your testimony, maybe they'll listen to you. Because they're not going to listen to me, but maybe they'll listen to you. Because it's your testimony. And we got to take that into account for each and every one of us. How God has changed us. How Jesus' love and the Holy Spirit has changed us in our testimony. So, moving on. Verse 40. When Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him. For they were all expecting him. So he returns to Galilee says, Just then, a man named Jairus came, who was a leader of the synagogue. He fell down at Jesus' feet and pleaded with him to come to his house, because he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was at death's door. While he was going, the crowds were nearly crushing him. There's so many people that they're nearly crushing him. A woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years who had spent all she had on doctors, remember who's writing this is Luke, who was a physician, a woman suffering for bleeding for 12 years, who had spent all she had on doctors, yet could not be healed by any, approached from behind and touched the tassel of his robe. Instantly her bleeding stopped. She touched his robe. The, the ends, a lot of times they'd have these, these little frilled ends on the ends of their robes touched a tassel, and instantly her bleeding stopped. She had been bleeding for 12 years. Most likely it's the feminine bleeding, once a month type thing, and hers hadn't stopped for 12 years. Continuous. She would have been marked as unclean. She wouldn't have been able to come in anywhere. You can go back and read some of the, the Old Testament laws on that, and they it was had to do with cleanliness and so on and so forth. Hers had been going on for 12 years, so she wasn't allowed in anywhere for 12 years. She touches the tassel, and instantly she, her bleeding stops, and she's healed. Jesus says, Who touched me? When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds are hemming you in and pressing against you. Like, Master, there's so many people around here. I'm sure you've been touched numerous times. There's so many people that they're pushing in against us. You know, what are you talking about here? And Jesus says, but someone did touch me. I know that power has gone out for me. So I know that someone just got healed because I felt a little bit of that power going out and healing somebody. Now, did Jesus know who it was? Yes, he did. He was waiting for somebody to speak up. Jesus already knew. When the, women, when the woman saw that she was discovered, so even she knows that he knows. She knows that he knows that he knows that she knows that. Yeah, they know. When she saw that she was discovered, she came trembling and fell down before him. In the presence of all the people, she declared the reason she had touched him and how she was instantly cured. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Because you believed that if you just touched my tacit, you would be healed. You had been to all these doctors. You had spent every bit of your money on these doctors that couldn't heal you. And you knew that if you touched me, that you'd be healed. Because of your faith, you are healed. Now go in peace. You're good. But while he was still speaking, remember why he was going through the crowd to begin with was because Jairus' 12-year-old daughter was dying. And that's why he was going through the crowd to begin with. Then he gets caught up with all this other stuff going on. While he was still speaking, someone came from the synagogue leader's house saying, Your daughter's dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. It's too late. It's too late. When Jesus heard it, he answered him, Don't be afraid. 
Only believe and she'll be made well. After he came to the house, he let no one enter with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Everyone was crying and mourning for her. But he said, stop crying, for she's not dead, just asleep. She's not dead, she's just sleeping. It says, they. They started laughing at him. Who's in that room with him? We just said this. Who's in that room with him? He didn't let anybody else in. And it uses the plural of they. Not specific. It, they meaning everyone. Peter, John, James, and the child's mother and father. They. Those five. It doesn't say the mother and father. And Peter, James, and John didn't. It says they. The five of them began laughing at him because they knew she was dead. So he took her by the hand and called out, Child, get up. Her spirit returned and she got up at once. Then he gave orders that she be given, she be given something to eat. Her parents were astounded, but he instructed them to tell no one what happened. So, Peter, John, and James are in that room. They laugh because they know that this little girl's dead. Jesus says, no, she's not dead. She's just sleeping. They all laugh. So Jesus says, okay. Child, go ahead and get up. Come on, wake up. She gets up. The parents are astounded. Peter, James, and John shouldn't have been astounded. Why did they laugh to begin with? Well, that's a deep theological question. And it goes into the fact that they, they knew and they had seen things that Jesus had done before. They knew in their hearts, they knew that he would have the power to do it. But in those moments, no, that girl's not, not, not asleep. She's dead. Jesus, she's dead. Was the girl dead? Yeah, the girl really was dead, and he raised her. So then you have the question of, why did he say she was just asleep? Because he was going to wake her back up. He was going to get her back up. Jesus knew that he was going to bring her back up to begin with. So why does he tell the parents when they're astounded, why does he tell them not to go and tell anyone about what had happened? Timing. It has to do with timing. He had more things that he had to do before everything came to light of who he actually was. And he didn't, he wanted the glorification to go to God. Look, those people, that, that one of those people from the synagogue leader's house came out and said, this girl's dead. There's a bunch of people that are crying. There's a bunch of people that are, that are upset. There's a bunch of people that are mourning that knew that this little girl was dead. Jesus Peter, James, P Jesus, Peter, James, and John go into that room and come out and the girl's awake. He wanted the glory to go to his father. Not his own person, not Peter, not James, not John. He wanted the glory to go to God, not to him. He wanted the glory to go to his father, not to him. That was the motivation. He wanted the glory at this point to go to the Father. Did these people go and tell anyways? Almost every time, this one doesn't specifically say it, but almost every time that Jesus tells someone, now don't go tell anybody what I did, the first thing they do is go tell everybody about what Jesus did. Because that's something that we can't we can't help. When Jesus does something for us, and we know it, and we feel it, and we've been healed of that, the first thing you want to do is you want to go tell everybody how great is our God. It's the first thing you want to do. Man, look at what has been given to me. Look at what has been blessed to me through Jesus Christ. It's the first thing we're going to do. At least it should be. At least it should be. So, 
with that, we're going to go ahead and close out today. Uh, it's been a longer message, so we're going to close out with a prayer. If you'll bow your heads with me. Dear God, we just come to you right now, and, and we thank you for this message. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your teachings. Lord, we thank you for all the healing and blessing that you have given us. Lord, we thank you for the deliverance. We thank you for the grace, the mercy, the, the forgiveness. We thank you for the sacrifice that you've given for us. And Lord, we just we just ask that we continue to be blessed. Lord, we ask that, that we continue to try to be a servant to you. Lord, we ask that, that that we that we can go and tell everyone about how you have blessed us. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. All right, again, <clears throat> um, check out the website. Uh, I'm going to be putting some new some new crosses on there, some new necklace crosses, and um, <clears throat> we will we'll have some new ones up there. And again, if you want anything, if you want something customized, if there's a certain color pattern, if there's a certain a certain way that you wanted a certain style of cross, let me know. Um, <clears throat> I, I definitely want to get better at this, so give me a challenge. Let me let me know. And all of them, if you give a donation, you'll get one of the cross necklaces, and I'll also get you a uh, verse uh, for any size donation. And that's any size donation. I don't care how much it is. I'll get one to you, and I'll figure out how to get it to you, whether we got to mail it or, or come pick up or meet at a certain point. or We'll figure out how to get it to you because you're not going to pay for that shipping. That's on me. So... Again, check out the website, and I will see you guys back on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Love you.